just fumble around up here and you get really loud. Hi, my name is Alex Phillips. I'm the Director of Assessment and Curriculum Development at Commonwealth Honors College. And I'm really pleased to see you all here. I hope your Thanksgiving was uh, pleasant. And I appreciate your coming out on a Monday evening uh, for this talk. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dean Priscilla Clarkson and Associate Dean Dan Gordon for their leadership and uh, vision, um, especially for um, supporting this course, Honors 291A, Ideas That Change the World. Um, we really do believe that this course, combined with your other Gen Ed and elective honors requirements and the English 112H course, will help you, will enhance your experience as undergraduates, and uh, will help you in your experience overall in life uh, and in your majors and careers. So uh, thank you, uh, Dan. I'm now going to introduce uh, Sabina Murray. Um, Sabina Murray is one of the treasures of UMass Amherst. I want to be brief in my remarks so that we can spend as much time with her as possible, but I also want to be clear about what a gift it is to have her here with us tonight. Sabina Murray is a professor in the Distinguished MFA Program for Poets and Writers here at UMass Amherst. She has a remarkable personal history, which I won't go into now, except to say that she's lived all over the world and continues to travel extensively. She lives to travel, she said in an interview. Here is something else remarkable. In 1989, which would have made her 20 at the time, her novel, Slow Burn, was accepted for publication. That's the same year she received her BA in art history from Mount Holyoke. She then went to UT Austin for graduate school where she was a missioner fellow, and after a quiet few years, has been extremely prolific over the last decade, publishing four more books, The Caprices, A Carnivore's Inquiry, Forgery and Tales of the New World. She's also completed five screenplays. I read some. Five screenplays, including the screenplay Terrence Malick commissioned her to write for Beautiful Country, and that was 2005. Now, I know this is going to start sounding unbelievable, piled on top of all of that, but here are some of the awards that she's won. Professor Murray has been a Missioner Fellow, which I mentioned, a Bunting Fellow at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute. She was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2007 and has received the Penn Faulkner Award, a Mass Cultural Council Grant, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, UMass Research and Creativity Award, and a Fred Brown Award for the novel from the University of Pittsburgh. Beautiful Country was nominated for a Golden Bear, and the screenplay was nominated for an Amanda Award, which are the equivalent of the Norwegian Oscars uh, and an Independent Spirit Award. Um, all that, and I haven't said anything about her teaching, which is by all accounts transformative. Many of her students go on to prestigious publications themselves. And what of her writing? Rather than butcher it with my own inept account, I'll simply read a tiny bit from the very beginning of forgery, and suffice it to say that for a course on ideas that change the world and a unit on art, there couldn't be a better extract. I will never be the sort of person to make a, a major contribution to mankind. That has never been my goal. I am not a creator, but a man of taste. And my story, like the story of civilization, begins with art. Who were we before art? I think of our prehistoric cousins desiring to make a fire. The ape says, I am cold, and my meal, less pulse, is exactly the same as before I ran it down. And perhaps this is the first instance of civilized humanity, a distinct encounter with dissatisfaction. Then the sparks ignite, and the ape casts his kill upon the flames, a willful transformation. And the ape comes out the other side of this, this experience, warm, uh, dining on, what did they have then? Woolly mammoths? Other apes? I'm not sure, but having cooked it, He's eating it, and the fire is leaping into his face, and his mate is sharing the feast, and the ape can finally say, that is good. Because before that, there was not good. There was just the absence of food against the presence of food. No choice, really. That hunger and certain death, or satiety and survival. As a man, the ape can compare food to food. The creation of man is tied to the development of taste. 
And for us tonight, we couldn't ask for a more tasteful guest. Please help me welcome Sabina Murray. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, see me present my lecture. Thanks to Alex Phillips for that great introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks to all the people from Com College, Dad Gordon, Priscilla Clarkson, Brian Dulac. Um, thank you for having me. I am going to read, here's my little light. I'm going to read uh, a lecture that I put together for this. Um, and, you know, I, it's just to cover, it covers my writing, it covers a little bit about history. No bells and whistles, no pictures, no slides, but I do hope that you think of questions because I'm very happy to entertain anything in a discussion when we're done. Right. Today, I am presenting a lecture titled The Writer's Perspective, Literary Imagination, and Living History. Basically, I'm speaking about the place where history and fiction overlap, what the value of this is to readers, and what makes this area of intersection of interest to a writer. I'm dealing with big topics. History, what happened, is big. Fiction, what might have, is even bigger. So what to do? In an effort to somehow streamline the seemingly boundless parameters of my chosen topic, I have decided to discuss certain aspects and figures of history, personal and public, that have shown up or will in my fiction. Is this echoing too much? Should I be back further? No, oh, it's okay. All right. These include acceptable bias. Ferdinand Marcos, formerly president of the Philippines. The Clavero, formerly a steamship. My father's time in a Jesuit seminary. Melancholy objects. New Jersey resident Joseph Bonaparte. Francisco Goya, The Donner Party, a caveat for women writers with Asian heritage, the possibility that one does not improve with age, and the sculpture of Philippe Letterston. We all know that history has a hard time keeping the record straight. We accept a certain amount of bias in our history as we're told, the FDA accepts a certain amount of insect parts in our food. And we all know that it is a slippery slope that leads from bias to outright fiction. On the way from history to fiction, there is a point at which the acceptable bias, someone is presenting the information and that creates a point of view, crosses a line and becomes an invented perspective. For example, that Hitler was an aggressive violator of human rights is an acceptable stance to take when presenting historical matter. But when a writer attempts to construct Hitler's thoughts in the bunker before he killed himself, that is the stuff of fiction. The historian struggles with the acceptable bias. The fiction writer, me, is a person who finds the odd particular perspective itself as the thing of interest. Fiction writers embrace this particularity. We're always looking for ways to make cold, abstract reality personal. We know that objectivity, the removal of one's own filter, is impossible. As fiction writers, we celebrate this. And why not? How can we take more than one point of view, no matter how sympathetic we are with the views of others? Our very presence demands that we process information in a subjective way. My comfort with the malleable nature of history also springs out of my high school education, which I spent in Manila, the Philippines, during the Marcos era. Ferdinand Marcos and his engaging wife Imelda ruled the Philippines for 20 years. Their corruption bankrupted the country and their ruthlessness left a trail of bodies, journalists, small-time politicians, perceived rivals, and finally, the exiled Senator Ninoy Aquino, whose assassination on the tarmac of the Manila airport, an airport that now bears his name, 
was the event that triggered the revolt that ousted Marcos. Ferdinand and Imelda were conjugal dictators with an endlessly inventive sense of their importance. Every year, as I tried to master Philippine history, I would be presented with a new book, and each time the section on the Second World War would be expanded to include yet another exploit of the daring young soldier Ferdinand Marcos in his fight against the invading Japanese forces. By the time I was a senior in high school, the book made it seem as if without the young Ferdinand, we Filipinos would have lost that war. Indeed, it seemed as though the Axis powers would have triumphed everywhere without Marcus's dashing, grenade throwing, barbed wire leaping, kung fu yelling exploits. But I knew, as did all my classmates, that Marcus was no hero. And the fact that we all carried with us deep in our souls was the knowledge that Marcus's father had been executed for collaborating with the enemy. Marcus's father in his hometown in the province of Ilojos Norte was drawn and quartered, his body torn to the points of the compass by water buffalo, scared into action by the firing of a gun. And the son? Despite what we read, we knew him to be a collaborator as well, yet, because I needed the grades, I memorized the elaborate fiction that had been presented to me. And although the facts were false, I learned a greater truth, to look for myself, to never let my judgment sleep, to be informed in an active, broad, and suspicious manner. History moved apace with the present, and as it gathered all the matter into its body, presented in ever-changing form. Fiction and history both have characters, people. History is nothing without its architects. This is how we're taught. We don't learn of early aeronautical engineering, but instead of the Wright brothers and their dreaming. We learn of intrepid Harriet Tubman and of Lewis and Clark, of Sacagawea, or is it possible that we do learn all the facts, dates, locales, and significances? But as time passes and our minds grow cluttered, what's left, what we all remember, is the people. Attila the Hun still thunders across the steps long after we've forgotten where he's going. As a fiction, a fiction writer understands the power of character, and instead of struggling against it, in favor of a more truthful fact builds on this power. The fiction writer creates a network of relevancies through people. Novelists and short story writers who work with history look at the events as if through the wrong end of the telescope, favoring the narrow perspective. And this is a worthwhile approach to the matter of the past because novels and short stories let us learn not only with a fact acquiring section of the brain, but also the heart. Fiction transports experience and knowledge through character, and its importance lies in its ability to translate the new in a way that creates empathy. What we learn through fiction, we don't learn through fact, we learn through people. We learn things through how people experience them. This is the very reason that when we think of Regency England, for example, if we think of Regency England, our guide for that is Jane Austen. Dickens has been our eyes through the poor houses of Victorian England, where we learn not only of the dehumanizing, far-ranging power of poverty, but also feel the hunger and cold that accompany it. Conrad gives us the Belgian Congo, has it acted out for us with some of fiction's most indelible figures. And I could go on. We particularly remember things learned through fiction because as people, we sympathize and identify with the experiences of other people. This is how we read. And we should be aware of this power, the power of character to illuminate the past, to keep it alive when we write. Last October, I traveled to Peru having booked passage on an Amazon tour. The boat was the Clovera, built in Paris in 1876 and brought to Peru for use as a naval vessel. 
From about 1890 to 1914, the rubber boom years, the Clavero plied up and down the Amazon and its tributaries, the Ucayali, Marañón, Tigre, Napo, and Putumayo, first employed in exploration, and then, once posts were established, to deliver the mail. Now the Clavero is used for ecotourism. I did want to see the birds and pink dolphins and the monkeys, but I had booked the tour to research my novel in progress, Valiant Gentleman. This book is about Herbert Ward, an English adventurer and sculptor, and Roger Casement, a humanitarian and Irish revolutionary. They are both historical figures. The two first meet in King Leopold's Congo and are close for a number of years, but the friendship disintegrates in a clash of loyalties during the First World War. In 1910, the 36-year-old Roger Casement is in Peru investigating allegations of slave labor brought against Cesar Arana, a rubber baron from Iquitos. Casement spends some time over the next few years chugging along the Amazon from Iquitos to Manaus while penning his impressive second indictment of the rubber industry, his blue book, and circuiting the drawing rooms of the moneyed and powerful enlisting support for his cause. I had wondered what Roger Casement might have thought on the Amazon, and was there myself to facilitate a more articulate wondering. To take my week-long trip on the Clavero entailed first flying into Iquitos. One must reach Iquitos by plane or by boat up the Amazon from Brazil. Iquitos had its heyday during the rubber boom, and there's a sense of decay about the town. The Clavero was docked an hour and a half away in the town of Nauta, gateway to the Amazon, and a minibus soon appeared to take me and the other travelers off to our adventure. The Clavero and its sister boat, the Ayapujo, were moored here, although there was nothing resembling a dock. A plank extended from bank to deck to accommodate embarkation, and in response to this promise of spectacle, a group of children and a few dogs had gathered. I overheard one of my fellow passengers ask if there were anything to see in Nauta, and the response of one of the crew, an unhesitating no. Women looked up from their washing to see me and the other gringos bounce across the plank, aided by sure-footed deckhands. As I stood on the narrow makeshift bridge, I could see my muddied reflection in the Amazon's black water and had that suspended feeling that one senses in the moments before falling asleep as dreams waft upward into consciousness. There is a porous boundary between the real and imagined, and on that plank I felt for an instant that the two were mingled. I could see the one imposed upon the other. The Clavero was to navigate up the Marignan River into the preserve where we would anchor at a station set up to monitor wildlife. There was a skiff with an outboard motor for forays up tributaries to local villages and to sites that offered interesting trails. Meals were to be served in the dining room, walled in fabric to create a rubber boom era vibe, where we would sit on chairs upholstered in red velvet. These details seemed comic, but somehow authentic and made me think that even in the 1890s, damask walls and red velvet cushions were a way of denying true location, as if these small European intrusions, a way to remain observantly European, had always been a bit pathetic in their attempt to ward off the wall of jungle and the power of the river as it slid itself and all upon it towards Brazil. The Clavero no longer ran on steam, but the constant rumble of the generator when silence produced a melancholy and frightening vacuum of sound. Somewhere behind the wall of vines and river's edge, below the bristling canopy noisy with a flash of macaws, there were wild rubber trees. In the tidy villages with their palm leaf groves and grassy plazas that doubled as soccer fields were the descendants of the Indians who had worked to collect the rubber. Obviously, the remove of 120 years had made a difference, but the place still held the echo of that time, as sand vividly holds the footprints of those who have recently passed. There is no absolute history. We know this.
To a certain extent, as I've said, history must be subjective. How it works is that we agree on a few key items, things, dates, the names of people, whatever is at stake. And between these inter intermittent anchors, we create linkages. There is a functionally infinite number of these agreed upon facts, and between them, in the spaces, a truly infinite number of places to mold how the facts are seen. As a writer, I agree to accept these facts. I avoid being speculative with events. I am most concerned with personality and in incidents shellacked by familiarity, revealing how it might feel to have witnessed firsthand. History seems to be a very public thing, but it must be engaged privately, privately and in this becomes personal. My father, spent a large chunk of his 20s as a Jesuit scholastic. There is a photograph taken in the late 50s of my father as a young man and he's wearing a cassock. As a child in a Catholic household where local priests would drop by unannounced and the bishop would walk me home on his way from his residence at Holy Rosary to hear confession at the Carmelite Monastery, men in robes were familiar to me. I know what the cassock meant the equivalent of the bat phone to God, and no children. The image of my smiling father so attired has no doubt contributed to my constant awareness of being here but by the grace of God, and the winking mischief of the future. The fact that I know warily that the future will surprise informs all of my work. Two years ago, deep into the writing of my most recent book, Tales of the New World, I visited my father, now a retired anthropologist in Maine. This book of stories is all about explorers, and I was sort of shopping for appropriate subjects. My father asked, was I interested in Hanno the Carthaginian, the first known navigator of the west coast of Africa? He had written a paper on this explorer while in the seminary, translating out of the Greek, and he still had it. As Tales of the New World is about explorers, it is also about their written accounts. And one important aspect of this book is how, at significant moments of history, the explorer has the power to create the new world for all those eager readers waiting back in civilization. So, as I considered subjects for my stories, my first question would be, what did this explorer do? And the second, What's the related document? As I paged through my father's essay, bound in a tan folder, typed the margins, typed, the margins filled with encouraging penciled notes from a long ago professor of Greek, I felt sure that the necessary document was the account of Hanno's journey engraved in Punic on a bronze tablet. Hanno's story, his accounts of fiery lakes and gorillas who are neither apes nor people, was intriguing enough but I couldn't find my way in. The classical world has been carted so casually through the ages, like a battered suitcase, that to try to chronicle the life of that time becomes inescapably comic. I do think David Maloof's novel about King Priam, Ransom, is an exception to this, but my classical figure, Hanno, seemed more cousin to Socrates of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure than any character from Virgil. I had made a mistake. I had not only chosen the wrong document, but the wrong explorer. The document was in my hands, my father's essay, and the explorer was therefore my father. The story, Paraplus, which literally means the wandering around, starts off with a young Jesuit scholastic in the seminary library writing a paper. He tries to think of how to write about Hanno, and at some point in the story decides that he's not going to write about Hanno the man, but rather about accounts of Hanno, and therefore the people who wrote about the explorer. And the young scholar's trials mimic mine as I attempt to wrestle the story onto the page, and also to engage the classical world in a meaningful way. The young seminarian quotes, questions the purpose of scholarship. He asks about the account of the Paraplus of Hanna. How many people have approached this document of 630 words and found volumes within it? 
How many words wash up against that original telling, conceived to neatly fit upon a bronze tablet, approaching and approaching in hopeful scholarly erosion? I don't know how much of the writing of this paper my father remembers, but I'm sure that whatever remains is now tainted with what I invented for him, that the details of my story, vivid, immediate, recent, have become mingled with the actual events, and that this memory, once a safe and distant historical fact, has become irrevocably tampered with by my fiction. Although the actual past would seem immutable, memories do change. So in a working sense of things, the past is constantly in flux. The actual bronze tablets on which the Paraplus was written are now lost and have been for some time. We owe our knowledge of Hanno to the work of Pliny that, history tells us, was brought west in the 15th century by a cardinal, most likely from Constantinople, in the decade after the city's fall to the Turks, then passed from a basal convent to a Protestant scholar during the Reformation, then, as a result of the Thirty Years' War, was carted off as Catholic booty to the Vatican. It is an interesting provenance, more interesting because the object is lost, and it is the story itself that we track. But the imprint of the original bronze tablet hovers in the mind's eye like a ghost. Often, it is the objects themselves that speak of the people that once owned them. And I'm sure that everyone here has experienced that specific melancholy that rises when we stand for too long in an antique store. Or, more powerfully, when we encounter a number of objects from our childhood, each one evoking in a speedy, visceral way the steady passage of time, each one echoing what has been lost in its assertion of what remains. The histories of objects and their ties to people, provenance, seems at first sentimental. However, as we all know, it affects the cost of things, and in that literally value story and sentimentality. Provenance puts a price tag on story. Stories are not always possible to validate in absolute ways, and questions of authenticity always flare around art, around objects that could be valuable, around people too. This is from my novel Forgery of 2007 that Alex read a little bit about, about uh, from in his introduction. A first person narrative told by Rupert Brigg, a specialist in decorative arts with some provenance issues of his own. Here a woman wants to sell Rupert a dresser. This dresser belonged to Joseph Bonaparte, she said. I knew all about Joseph Bonaparte. In 1816, Napoleon's brother Joseph, once king of Naples, once king of Spain, finding himself without a kingdom and banned from living in France, made the unusual choice of relocating to New Jersey. He created an estate called Point Breeze, just over the river from Pennsylvania, and began calling him the Count de Servilier. The house he built was enormous, and he filled it with stuff, including works by Titian, Velazquez, Rubens, Rembrandt, and da Vinci. I'd read somewhere that he had a mirror hanging over his bed, and that the walls in his bedchamber were covered with paintings of nude ladies and famous conquest scenes along the lines of the rape of Europa. The paintings were all auctioned off in 1847, along with the other stuff, the tables and chairs, bookcases, dresses, and candlesticks, the fine china, the sterling flatware. <coughs> Much of the Joseph Bonaparte hoard is not authentic, and Rupert knows that the dresser fails in this regard. But the woman's need is real, and so he chooses to purchase the dresser, finding the woman's emotional pull of a more valued authenticity. I like writing about art because I like writing about objects. My working definition of art is that it's the object that is valued for what it is rather than what it can do. But despite this rather broad definition, I most like writing about paintings. The first artist I was ever aware of was Goya. My mother had a small, elegant volume of his work with colored plates, and I spent hours flipping through it. The editor of this particular volume had a thing for gore and gothic, 
And although the Mahas and Spanish royals did make an appearance, the glossy pages most often depicted witches, devils, people wielding knives and guns, people collapsed in violent deaths. There was one painting, however, which stood out from the rest, and this was of Saturn devouring his offspring. The painting itself was shocking, but also the story, a parent who eats his children. I was already scared of cannibals thanks to a creepy wooden statuette that my anthropologist father had in his study, an Ifugao tribesman with, dismembered, with a dismembered foot. But the Goya, a European sensibility that also admitted the existence of this particular horror, drove it home for me. The Ifugao, Filipino tribesmen living in remote areas who, in the present era, are far more, far more likely to eat a frozen pizza than a neighbor, seemed just that, remote. But the Goya, if Saturn was both mythological and therefore not human, I had only to turn a couple of pages to see a depiction of a very Spanish-looking, pair of very Spanish-looking Iroquois eating some unfortunate Jesuits. People could eat people, and people probably did. And if I had a hard time picturing what that looked like, well, here was going to help me out. I turned to this subject, cannibalism, from my novel of 2004, The Carnivore's Inquiry. A Carnivore's Inquiry is a black comedy that follows a young woman as she travels around ruminating on cannibalism in Western culture, meeting men, and eating them. I was thinking about the saber-rattling aspect of America, the part of the culture characterized by a need in conquering and subduing. Manifest destiny and all that, which brings with it a dangerous innocence. Back in the 1800s, when people were actually manifest with destiny and heading westward, it was a dangerous prospect. We all know of splintered wagons, wagon wheels, intrepid pioneers picked off by Indians, grim bonnet-wearing grandmas, brave Bible-clutching children, and all of that heading across the plains and either stopping there or continuing on to California. Although the majority of Americans at this point were still peasants in Ireland and Italy or Mexico or Iran or China, we all inherit this pioneering legacy. That's the spirit of the country, positive or negative. Strike out, make it yours. But of all these parties that headed west out from Missouri onward, the most famous, the one remembered by name, is the Donner Party. They're special because they got snowed in in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and those who did man survive managed it through cannibalism. And the Donner Party does make it into a carnivore's inquiry. A right of Keysburg, the last survivor who was cooking some part of Mrs. Murphy, one of those grim bonneted grandmas who has made it westward, but not quite west. Snows. <laughs> crazy. Snow settled on the cold, withered legs of Mrs. Murphy, dusted her hair, filled the crevices of her mutilated body. She was missing an arm. Her eyes stared out just to the left of the door, and Keysburg thought maybe he should adjust the chair so she would, leave, she would be looking more at it, less at nothing. Keysburg stirred the pot. Maybe he was wondering about Alder Creek when he heard the moaning outside as if the crazy Irish had brought with them their banshee, because a crazy Irishman would need something like a banshee screaming to tell him death was near, when all a German needed was to look at the amount of food divided by the amount of people, divided by the amount of days. So a little on the intrepid American character and some cultural inheritance. That is the meat, excuse the pun, of a carnivore's inquiry. I've already mentioned the ability of the, of the lost object to evoke memory. And much of the time in the articulation of what has been lost, that is abstract, security, joy, self. People will speak of things that evoke the reality of feeling. My mother, whose life was shattered when the Japanese marched into Manila in 1941, Mike's, marks her childhood in a before and after registry of objects. 
Children are always fascinated by the bizarre reality that their parents were once children. And I remember my mother telling me of her childhood in Manila. She had a shark skin dress, very sophisticated and not the thing for most little girls, and a Shirley Temple doll, life size, purchased somewhere in the old Manila downtown. Some store with uniformed attendants and long glass windows, the kind of place that didn't survive the war, and even if it had, would have been inaccessible to my mother, whose father, the giver of these gifts, was killed. In addition, after the war, and because of her father's death, her family lived in reduced circumstances and could no longer afford such goods. Not surprisingly, I was curious about the Pacific Campaign of the Second World War. What my mother supplied in silence, I would balance with fact. And so I purchased an impromptu course of study. I pursued an impromptu course of study that consisted of history, collections of personal accounts, things of that nature. My story collection, The Caprices, which takes its title from the Goya series of etchings, charts the Japanese occupation of not only the Philippines, but of other occupied territories with a particular interest in how the invading Japanese displaced American and European colonialism. There is always a personal pull to certain subject matter. But as a woman, and particularly as a woman with Asian heritage, I am aware of an expectation that the best one can write is loosely fictionalized memoir. Three generations of strong, strong Asian women or representations of cultural awkwardness in a new land, mom's stinky food, are the standard models for what sells in the US written by people like me. And despite the fact that of the nine stories in the Caprices, only three are set in the Philippines, and only one can count as memoir, the other two being heavily and inventively plotted, the book was often described as me writing about my family, appropriate behavior for a woman of my background. However, the character I identify with in that book is an Anglo-Indian man named Harry Gillen, who is the subject of the story Order of Precedence. This may seem odd since he's a man, and Indian, and a soldier, and a polo player, all things that I am not. However, the fact that he is of mixed background and spends his time both in and out of the culture at the same time speaks to me. He is also both critical and compl complicit in the colonial culture, which I understand. Near the end of the story, Harry, now a prisoner of war in Changi in Singapore, goes to visit a major barrister, his former commanding officer with whom he has a fraught relationship, and who, although it seems a lifetime ago, had him blackballed at the club back in Jubilapur, where he was being considered for membership due to his skill at polo. Clearly, Beristeed was sleeping, but his eyes were open a crack and the white showed, although the irises quivered into view. Major Beristeed whispered Harry, it's Lieutenant Gillen, sir. The eyes shuddered open. Lieutenant Gillen, Harry repeated. Beristeed took a deep breath. Harry, you look well, Harry nodded. So, the Major's face relaxed. I finally found a club that would take us both. I seem to be working backward through my books. A lot of people who know my work consider The Caprices, which was published in 2002, to be the first. But there is another, a novel, Slow Burn, that came out in 1990. That is a long time ago, and I was 20 when it was accepted for publication. Slow Burn follows party girl Isabel de la Fortuna as she navigates the crash and burn social scene in Manila in the days before Marcus's fall. It's not a particularly long book, nor complicated, but recently, preparing for another lecture, I returned to take a look at it, something I hadn't done for a decade, and realized with some anxiety that my writing style was much the same as it had been in college. This is from a funeral scene. The service was endless. Her many mourners, family and friends, serfs and servants, were listed along with all her good deeds most of which she seemed to have accomplished post-mortem. My mother sat in front of me, well sedated, well behaved. Nothing was natural. 
Even the light was filtered into purples and reds, and the air was thick with the sweet smell of incense. Children's voices floated up from the choir box, and people wept beautifully. I do believe that my subject matter has become more sophisticated in the past 23 years, but beyond that, there is not much that separates that writing from what I do today. Although when I wrote those lines, I couldn't have predicted that I would rely so heavily on research for my writing that half the fun of the process for me would be the research, and without it, the prospect of sitting in my study at the desk with my imaginary friends making things up would get very dull very quickly. What inspired me to travel to Peru this past October was that I wanted to see a wild rubber tree. I saw monkeys and macaws, venomous snakes, and poison frogs. But finding that tree after a morning's hike really made the trip. Here I am, the tree seemed to say. And when the guide whacked its trunk with a machete, it dutifully produced the milky substance, a trickle of, of rubber, sticky stuff that had altered the course of history. When the week-long Amazon adventure ended and I, back in Nauta, recrossed the plank onto solid ground, I felt as if I were not only coming back to land, but also to the 21st century, a place of cell phones and televisions, commerce and connection, a place of engines and roads. I had a couple of days to wander around to Quito, so I went to see the sites, all of them, at least all listed in the guidebook which pointed you in the general direction of things, but didn't tell you what you might expect upon arriving. The Museo de Amazonica seemed a good place to go, not only since it was within an easy walk of my hotel, but also because the building had served as a seat of government at some point during the rubber boom. I wanted to see some rooms, some decorative arts, although Akita seemed weirdly familiar, as it has much in common with any provincial Filipino town. I felt oddly at home there, even though my Spanish is next to non-existent. The Museo de Amazonica building itself was attractive, but not remarkable. Two stories set around a courtyard, the sort of building you get in places like Mexico City and Manila, places built to deal with heat before the advent of air conditioning. If the guide for hire had given me a choice, I might have said no, but his intensity was sort of entertaining. And I thought, even if the information he provided was a bit suspicious, a little escape from my own solitude seemed healthy. And what was there to see? The building itself, a few faded photographs of the Aikido streets, much the same, only then, with horses dragging carts, women dragging skirts, and men curtained behind sweeping mustaches. But also, and more interestingly, were the statues of the Amazon Indians. These were life-size and fiberglass, although all were painted a garish gold to approximate bronze. The sculptures were the work of Philippe Letterston, a Swedish-born artist who grew up in Lima. Letterston, who began the Sons of Our Land project in 1986, traveled up and down the Amazon finding tribes that were still living in the traditional way. He would then cast their likenesses costumes and all, and execute full body molds in plaster. His goal was to preserve the tribes before they vanished. Latterston must have been a very literal person. The sense one gets looking around the galleries and hallways of the Museo de Amazonica, cluttered with these gold Indians, isn't exactly the feeling one gets when gazing at fine art. I thought of the myth of King Midas, but not the classical Midas, but rather one filtered through an episode of Lost in Space, something that had been lost in the space of my childhood that somehow came back to me in Iquitos. These Indians cluttered the hallways of the museo, busily making fires, collecting medicines, often in finery. I'd been in the jungle and had seen some of the people. I, like Philippe Latterston, like Roger Casement, also had the feeling that I was witnessing this paradise women washing at the river's edge with pink dolphins nosing up to them playfully in its last moments. I had gone to find ways to make the past live and breathe, and here, with these gilded Indians, was witnessing the opposite. Somehow, Letterston had taken the living, breathing present and relegated it to the distant past. 
Roger Caseman had written a letter to Herbert Ward. He thought Ward would have rejoiced to have the molding of those shapely arms in real bronze. I wondered how he might have reacted to the spectacle of golden Indians peeking from behind shelves, cluttered in the galleries, gathering dust, chipping paint. And I wonder, when the Amazon Indians are lost to progress, if these objects will become significant. They will be the melancholy objects, the markers of what history is left behind. They will be all we have, and maybe from them we will think to create the magical Indians, the real Indians, the Indians of the mind. Thank you. All right. I, I understand that some people will now run away for dinner and studying and other commitments, and others will ask me questions. So both those options, I think, are okay. Yeah. Before you run away, we want to present <laughs> Professor Murray with this uh, token of our appreciation for her lecture tonight. Thank you so much for the <laughs> So, um, uh, as she said, if, if you have questions, please come up to the front, and you can even sit in the front row, and we'll have a, a, a small, intimate Q&A, and, and um, otherwise, have a great evening. Thanks for being with us tonight.